Hello? Okay. Um, see, okay. Uh, today, yes, I will uh, switch a little bit gear with respect to the other days, uh, trying to introduce um, a geometrical way to actually describe uh, physical processes, uh, specifically for the wave function that uh, uh, we have been discussing in this in this day. I decided to divide it into parts because uh, it's probably the part of uh, the topic which is uh, less less familiar. And if I was uh, had been slow for the previous lectures, probably will be extra slow uh, for these ones because, uh, yeah, I think um, it's good. Yeah, I prefer that uh, the message goes through than just uh, provide uh, a bunch of information that tomorrow you already forget forgot about them. So before doing this, in any case, let's do a small recap of uh, the lectures of, of, of yesterday. So what were the, the main messages? The first message was that uh, um, the, there is a correspondence between the uh, singularities <clears throat> of uh, the wave function and the uh, <clears throat> subgraph and, um, uh, of, um, of um, the graph. Associated uh, to Psi. What, is, uh, what, 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 what this meant? This meant that uh, if uh, we take uh, this uh, this process, where again from the vacuum uh, we are getting the boundary for states, okay. Uh, we can already know what uh, what are the singularities by, just by looking at this graph, by uh, by saying that uh, uh, by associating the sum of energies of the subprocess associated to each piece of the subgraph. What does what does it mean? This means that, for example, if I take this graph, the first uh, subgraph of a graph is the graph itself, which is this one. And I will associate the, uh, the energy uh, of this uh, process, which is uh, in this case, the total energy. So we know that uh, there is this singularity. Then another subprocess is just given by what's happened here at the vertex. And then you associate the energy at this vertex, the energy of this vertex is given by the sum of the external energies and the energy of the internal state. So if, as usual, I indicate this with Y, we know that there is this other singularity. And finally, the same at this other vertex. So we know that uh, this uh, this process will have singularities at this uh, four uh, um, four points. I have three points. Sorry. Now, uh, another thing that we learn is that we can actually uh, as map this graph to what uh, I call reduced sub uh, reduced graph. Because what um, we did yesterday was actually mapping um, the wave function in a generic uh, FRW cosmology, associated again, the contribution to the graph G, um, to a function, uh, uh, the, the contribution to graph G to a function in uh, arbitrary FRW cosmology. What we said that this can be seen as an integral over the external energies at each vertex. So 
if this V is the set, the set of the all vertices um, with the, a measure, which depends on the cosmology of the flat space wave function um, associated with the, same, with the same graph. And therefore, which depends on the energies at uh, a vertex and the internal energies which associate to the edge. So well, this is because when we do the computation, you realize that uh, the energies at the, uh, the external energies at the vertex enters enter always in the combination of their sum. So in this case, it's like saying that I indicate E1 plus E2 as let's say X1, E3 plus E4 and X2. And so really the condition are X1 plus X2 equals zero, X1 plus y equals zero, y plus x2 equals zero. And so rather than drawing all this graph, one thing you can do is just um, um, erase the external, uh, the back to boundary um, uh, legs and just having this graph where now the label y is associated to the vertex and the label x1 and x2 are associated to the, um, to the, to the sides. Okay, so the, uh, and so, and this is the third point. The general idea is that you can exploit all the structure of the flat space wave function, which uh, given that now acts as an integrand, uh, um, sometimes I call uh, uh, universal integral, integrand. And then you decide what, your, what is your cosmology by fixing what is this measure. And you see how the, this uh, um, part of the integration interacts with the, the singularities and uh, the, the structure of this, uh, of this, um, uh, of this integrand. So the, the general statement is that there is a number of uh, um, feature of the uh, wave function uh, arbitrary FRW cosmologies which are inherited by this, from the structure of uh, uh, this uh, uh, universal uh, uh, of this universal integral. And uh, for example, for this case, uh, uh, doing the computation, uh, this um, uh, this uh, this graph. Uh, will give the simple answer for this universal integral. And so if you want to extract, if you want to compute the uh, wave function associated to some uh, um, FRW cosmology, what one has to do is to do the integral from big, big hex, which are the actual external energies. Now, if I, uh, one thing that, um, so this, if you remember, was coming from the fact that we were modeling. Um, uh, so this is actually uh, in this precise form was true for uh, conformally coupled scalar. In FRW cosmologies. Um, and uh, um, uh, and uh, we were modeling this through an action which is was a flat a massless flat space action with a time dependent coupling where so it is just some field definition in which you um, change the you you change the position of the warp factor of your metric from being in uh, in front of uh, the kinetic term and being just encoded into the interaction. So what you had is that this time-dependent coupling 
pretty much can have this form where this is the warp factor. Uh, and if you choose, uh, and so what we were doing to obtain this form was just taking uh, an integral representation um, It was some else, but one. Okay, and so doing some change of uh, some uh, some uh, shift in uh, in the integra in the integration variables to get to this form. Now, <clears throat> um, if we choose a um, warp factor of this form, um, then this uh, lambda tilde of z uh, with up here let me put an eta minus eta uh, a theta minus eta because in any case this eta runs from just from minus infinity to zero then you get that the, this uh, this measure will have the form of uh, okay up to some number uh z to some power alpha minus one Theta z, where this alpha is just uh, gamma so minus chi minus so minus one alpha. Okay. And so if you think, uh, so if actually I substitute this form here and I shift again uh, the variable of integration in such a way that I get uh, your, my integral from zero to plus infinity, you get. Uh, the form of integral that you saw in uh, uh, Guillermo Pimentel uh, uh, lecture. So you get uh, that uh, uh, for that type of uh, FRW cosmology cannot be written in this form. Okay, so the origin of those integrals that you saw in uh, Guillermo's talk is precisely this idea that uh, you can um, um, write for a conformally coupled scalar your uh, wave function in an, in an arbitrary FRW cosmology as an integral over a measure which specify which cosmology you have uh, um, and, uh, of, of an integrand which is the flat space uh, the flat space wave function. Now this picture is a little bit more general because uh, uh, actually this, the for example other st scalar states like uh, massless or other light states are related uh, through um, differential operators to the conformal couple. So uh, I won't go into details uh, of that here, but then you can. Take uh, this uh, this uh, this formulas, apply some differential operator, and get the answer. Also for other states, in this in this sense, even if we started with a very um, specific type of toy model, you can get uh, a larger number of information about uh, a larger class of toy model. The last thing I want to specify is that uh, therefore, if you look at this type of formula, what we know what you know is that. Uh, uh, this parameter alpha, which come from this Fourier, uh, the, 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 from this uh, integral representation, really is encoding the cosmology, is encoding uh, the number of dimension, the special dimension, And it's encoding also the number, the, um, uh, the, the, the type of interaction.
because this guy is telling you that you have a phi to the k interaction. So this was for polynomial for polynomial interaction. Now, if you don't have polynomial interaction, if you have derivatives which just are special derivative, everything goes through. You are gonna just are gonna get a numerator which depends on uh, this, this derivative, but uh, the singularity structure will be completely unchanged. So this formula will be the same uh, with the, a, an extra numerator. If instead you have also time derivative, things a little bit uh, different, so the, the rules change a little bit and the expression is a little bit more, more complicated. Okay, but yes. That's correct. No, th th that's correct. I typically draw that uh, like a phi cube because uh, it's uh, it's easier. But in a sense, the good thing is that you know that uh, writing in this parameterization, this x one x two is just related to the sum of the external energies at a vertex. So even here, you can put uh, a phi cube and a phi four. It, it doesn't matter. The structure is not going to change. In this sense. Uh, uh, with just uh, a type of formula, you can get uh, uh, information about uh, different type of uh, interaction. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, draw a uh, more general conclusion. Uh, so uh, for this reason, this is universal in, um, in many senses. It's universal because uh, uh, the integrand uh, doesn't depend on the cosmology. You have to introduce dependence of cosmology through the, through the measure. It's universal because uh, it's show manifestly that the structure is the same and no matter what is the number of points of interaction and no matter what is uh, the number of uh, special uh, dimensions. Okay. And so the final thing that we learned last yesterday was that precisely, uh, if you remember when we computed explicitly for the first time, this, this formula was uh, using the explicit expression of the bulk to bulk uh, propagator, which is a preterm expression, you are getting three terms with a spurious singularity and then uh, you could massage it you will get in this one ternary expression what thing uh, the last thing that we learned yesterday was that uh, precisely uh, keeping in mind the fact that there is an association between singularity and uh, and subgraphs uh, you could uh, we, we proved a recursion relation for which if you multiply the total energy of the process for your wave function, then this is just given by erasing an, the, the edge, okay? And associated to each vertex, the energy of the vertex itself by shifted by the energy of the internal state, okay? So for a more general graph, for example, for a higher point, a higher vertex graph, This will be given by iteratively erase one edge at a time. So this is x1, x2, x1, x2, x3. So here I erased the, this, this edge. Now you have to sum the other term that you will get by erasing the other edge. And this is actually true also at loops. And obviously, again, that in the, in the case of loops is gonna give you the integrand of the loops in the sense that you don't have just this integration. Here, you have to think that also you have to do the loop integration, okay? And so this also oh, oh, could be mapped in the in um, uh, um, uh, graphical rules, which was that you were take you take the graph, this reduced graph, and then you iteratively divide it in connected uh, subgraphs, and associate to, to it the inverse of the sum of the energy of the subgraphs. For example, let's do this, this, uh, this example again. Now, the first subgraph 
is the graph itself. The external energy uh, is uh, the sum of all the energies. So that x1 plus x2. Now this uh, can be divided into subgraphs just in a way. And I associate again x1 plus y. And finally, the other one. And then you get on the spot the, uh, the final answer. For this one, again, you will have to do uh, for this other for this other graph, you have to do the same thing. You take the big graph and you write one over x1 plus x2 plus x3. Then now I have two ways in which I can divide this into connected subgraphs. So I have to sum about on these two ways. So if I take uh, uh, this first subgraph, I, I do the same job, x1 plus x2 plus y23. And then I keep dividing this in okay, this, this other two. And you get one over x1 plus y12, and one over y12 plus x2 plus y23. And then you do the same for, for, for uh, the, 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 other, the other option that you have, but I'm gonna write it directly. Uh, so with this rule, no matter how complicated the, the graph is, you can write on the spot, uh, uh this uh, um, uh what is uh, the, the uh, this integrand by just applying these uh, rules uh, recursively okay so it it provides a very general way to actually write this and this is if you notice this this is it just has a physical pulse in the sense that you see you don't have minus you, see, you really have only uh poles which are associated with the subgraphs and for the way that, uh, uh, and this actually turns out to correspond to what people usually call old fashioned perturbation theory or time order perturbation theory in, uh, in uh, normal, uh, in, uh, in a fat space, they call it this way. Okay. So now the message uh, instead of the lecture. So, okay, before going ahead, uh, is there any question about, about this? Teaching us something old-fashioned. Well, uh, sometimes uh, they are can be good methods for of computation. In any case, well, one of the nice thing of, um, uh, for example, uh, this way of computing it with respect to, uh, of um, uh, using uh, explicitly the back-to-back -back propagator is the fact that you don't ever get uh, uh, spurious poles, and also you don't have to do the time integrals once you have a general proof that this. Uh, uh, um, recursive structure exists, you can just apply it and you don't even have to know that uh, behind uh, uh, that there is another way of computing them is doing the time integration. So in this way, yesterday I was, I was referring to this type of computation as a sort of boundary computation because whatever you need to know is uh, like the spectrum of the theory and uh, the energies because this why, even if we call it external um, internal energy, what this really is, is the sum of all the momenta which come from, from a vertex, okay? So really, these are all external data. So you don't ever have to talk about uh, um, anything that is happen in, inside. This is true even for loops. Yeah, so you can compute, for example, the bubble in uh, an easy way. So these rules will give you also a two-term expression. Well, if you have, if you will do uh, the uh, Feynman way of computing it, you will get a nine-term expression with some spurious poles. Okay. But in this, will give how many? Uh, if you compute, you uh, if you compute using uh, the Feynman uh, the the Feynman rules. It, this will give you uh, nine terms, and also this because you get three term for each each uh, each uh, edge. 
Okay. So three to the two is nine. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So now uh, the goal. Uh, the, so the, the um, um, this recursive structure. This com uh, uh, really is hiding some combinatorics. Which is actually what will be encoded in this geometrical uh, approach that uh, um, I'm gonna describe now. Very soon. If there is any other question, I think this is yes. Uh, when you say more complicated, you refer to having um, uh, derivatives. Yeah. So um, if you have uh, because in cosmology you can have. Uh, separately time derivatives and special derivatives. So if you have just special derivatives, everything uh, goes through the same. The only difference is gonna be that you're gonna get some numerator which come from uh, the special derivatives. If instead you have time derivatives, the rules change a little bit because if you were to do the Feynman rules, you also have to consider that the derivatives, uh, uh, the time derivative act also on the, on the propagator. And the point is that when you have uh, uh, when you act with the derivative of the propagator, the theta bar function gets mapped in some uh, delta delta function, and so you get also some boundary contributions that here you do not have. Okay, so the rules change, change a little bit. But uh, what uh, does not change is uh, the, uh, the singularity structure. So one thing that actually you can think to do is some sort of uh, passeino Veltman type of uh, approach where uh, you use uh, this type of graph as basis and then uh, going to the singularities and you knowing what are the amplitudes associated to the lower point uh, uh, processes, you can fix the, the numerators, which is actually much more effective than having to do all this, uh, the, the actual modified rules. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So in this case, given that uh, uh, yeah, um, you have also this integral, you can uh, even do this uh, passerino Veltman reduction at, uh, at three level, not just a loops. Okay, so, um, very good. So now the starting point for uh, figuring out that there is some uh, interesting mathematical structure behind uh, uh, these um, wave functions, and then actually you can even use it as uh, a first principle definition for uh, this object. Is precisely the fact uh, is uh, the fact that we can uh, uh, describe these processes through these uh, uh, reduced graphs. So. Let's us start from here. Now, one thing that we can do is thinking that these labels, x1, x2, or y, are homogeneous coordinates in projective space. In this case, it's P2. So the way to think is that you have vectors in R3. and you intersect them with a plane where some uh, figure live, if you have some, uh, some vectors. And so any point along this ray is really equivalent. So projective space is just R3 uh, made out, uh, P2 is just made out of uh, R3 vertices. For example, if, uh, if Z is uh, an R3 vector, but then you require that all uh, the points along this ray are equivalent, which means that uh, this relation has to hold. So you really have uh, one degrees of freedom left. So this uh, condition will tell you that uh, this vector z will uh, uh, will be inside. Uh, it will be it will be projective. Will be in two. Okay. So I, I guess that this uh, is everything that you have to remember if you are not familiar uh, of uh, projective geometry if you are not familiar with it. So everything. Uh, all these points are uh, uh, are equivalent, so there is a, a, a class of equivalence of vertices of of, of points, 
which means that whatever expression you get better be to make uh, some, some sense invariant under this rescaling, which is what uh, in a comment that I made uh, uh, during uh, Julio's talk uh, is called uh, GL1 invariance. Okay, so le let's go back here. So let's say that, uh, um, so I take this graph, I declare that these uh, variables here are homogeneous coordinate, given the three are gonna be a homogeneous coordinate in P2. And so one thing that we, we observed is that uh, this graph has subgraphs to which we can associate uh, some uh, conditions, which were X1 plus X2 equal zero, X1 plus Y equal zero, and Y plus X2 equal zero, okay? If we picture this on, in P2, these are just lines. For example, this can be the line x1 plus x2 equals zero. This can be the line um, x1 plus y equals zero. And this is the line x1 plus y equals zero. Now, if uh, we choose uh, some orientation, let's say, the, let me call it this vertex one, vertex two, vertex this intersection, vertex three, and I choose this orientation for this line. The this is will be the positive half plane. I, I didn't identify by this line. This is negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So you'll see that the condition, the uh, positive, uh, the, so that these three lines identify some uh, area. Okay, so in this case, they identify a triangle. So identify a triangle. Now, as uh, Giulio um, in his uh, talk uh, um, um, uh, described yesterday, well, also the triangle is a polytope and to any polytope, you can associate a differential form, okay? Uh, which is given by a condition that uh, it um, it has uh, um, denominators which correspond to the boundaries. In this case, x1, x2, x1 plus y, y plus x2. And in principle, whether your numerator is a number or is a function is also determined by the uh, GL two conditions, so the, the, this, uh, the, this measure written explicitly will be just um, the x1, the y, the x2, this is the volume or gel one. This precisely tells you that you uh, need to fix, uh, uh, that these are homogeneous coordinate, okay? And then you see, the, the, as I said before, this has to be invariant under this, um, uh, this rescaling, which will mean underscaling all the x's and y's uh, together. But you see that uh, here you have uh, uh, three monomials. You have uh, the, the measure, is, it has also made by the product of three stuff. So here you know that there is there's a number should be here. Okay, let's say that here it is one. One thing that you recognize now is that precisely this uh, th this uh, rational function that appear in front, what is typically called canonical function, is precisely the wave function associated to this uh, this graph. So the general statement is that for each graph G, there exists a unique. There, is, there exists a, a polytope PG such that his uh, canonical form as uh, uh, the canonical function, which is precisely the wave function associated with the graph. Okay? So you map the um, problem of uh, computing and studying the your wave function into the problem or uh, computing and other analyzing this uh, uh, canonical function or canonical form. 
Now, just, just to be clear, this measure just mean that you're taking the determinants of this uh, three vector. So what you are saying is that you have some epsilon i, j, k, y, i, d, y, j, d, y, k, okay? Where these are the indices that tells you that, for example, in this case, you are a vector uh, yeah, with, three, uh, with three components. So this formula in a complete invariant way a GLY invariant way can be written in this form. Where these one, two, uh, and three are uh, the vectors associated to this, uh, um, to the intersection among these, uh, these lines, which uh, you can compute them to be Z1, 1 minus 1, 1, Z2, 1, 1 minus 1, and Z3 minus 1, 1, 1. And the number here, I wrote this way, is again the determinant of these three vertices. So it's a, an actual number. And you need the precise number because I said before, you want that if I rescale, for example, Z1, by some lambda, you want this the, the full uh, uh, the full uh, form to be invariant. So here I have two power of 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 one. I need two power of one at the numerator. The same for two, the same for three, and so this is unique things that you can write. Now, as somebody commented in, during Julio's talk, in principle, this form is uh, fixed up to a sign here. But the sign is just uh, given by the orientation. Okay, you decide the orientation and you fix the sign, but this is an arbitrary choice. Okay. The arrows here, yes. And also, once you pick one orientation, all the others have to follow the same uh, orientation. Uh, well, you might decide to choose some case orientation, but then if something is positive, it becomes negative. So it, the, the, the will change the positivity condition. It's better to choose some uh, something which is uh, um, gives you oriented surfaces so that you don't have this problem. And, and everything boils down to just plain positivity conditions. So now, one thing that you understand from uh, this idea is that uh, if I take uh, a bigger graph, okay, uh, also the dimensionality of the space where uh, the object that uh, gives you the wave function lives, it's uh, bigger. So here I could draw a triangle, but in general you cannot do, do the drawing. So uh, one has to learn how to study these objects without having to draw them. I mean, a triangle, a triangle, there is nothing to study, okay? So one general thing that you can um, guess is the fact that given that my, the space where this object lives has homogeneous coordinates, which are given by the, the labels associated with the graph, then if I have some arbitrary graph, the homogeneous uh, coordinates uh, in the space that you can associate to the space is just the list of all the axes the list of all the y's, okay? Which means that uh, the polytop will live in a projective space, which is, uh, as dimension, number of, of uh, vertices of the graph plus number of the edges of the graph minus one, which is the projective condition, okay? So they are, ve they are uh, vectors in N NS plus NE, but then, uh, they are projective, so the projective space ns plus any minus one. Okay. Now, before um, going to how, for example, yes. Directly, I would say it lives in R and S plus N. So why do we import this GS one condition to? Um. I, I couldn't guess. No, you see, imagine that you have um, the, no, the, 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 um, um, when you have homogeneous coordinates, even if you want to think in terms of uh, R, so if uh, homogeneous coordinates means that you have uh, 
your expression, which uh, is written in terms of uh, some polynomial, okay, of uh, some degree delta. But then the polynomial of degree delta is all the time, all the terms as products of all the variables. You don't never have uh, different uh, type of powers. For example, uh, you can have uh, when you have a linear polynomial, you have all the time something like x1 plus y plus x2, for example, but you never have something like x1 plus one. Okay. So when when you have you are in homogeneous coordinate, even if you want to think about uh, a, a real space, you're implicitly in uh, in projective space. Okay. Because then you can always fix. Uh, um, you, you, uh, um, if you are in homogeneous coordinate, you can always uh, make some some rescaling, and it's going to have a precise behavior in, in, in the rescaling. Here, if you do some rescaling, each of the thing behave like, um, like like one wants. Okay. And now in this case, the fact that you have a GL1 invariant, because in principle you have some, some sort of covariance, you can do the rescaling and you can have uh, some, uh, for example, if uh, I will have had some power square, if I have, uh, if I do this uh, type of, um, uh, of, of GL1 transformation, you will get some uh, lambda in, in front here. And in that case, uh, the problem is that uh, the forms are not uh, uniquely, uh, uniquely, def uniquely defined. So you, um, this, so the request of GL one invariance in general is uh, the um, um, in, in, to have something which is uh, well defined and implicitly from a, a more physical perspective that implies that uh, your uh, object as only logarithmic singularities, okay? If you have something like one over X squared, logarithmic singularity means that if I do some change of variable, I can rewrite these things as the Z1 over Z1, the Z2 over Z2, the Z3 over Z3, okay? So if you do that, you have just simple poles. When you have simple poles and you put a measure, if you do some whatever is scaling, these things is invariant. So in a sense, the fact that uh, you think in projective space and think becomes immediately nicer is because uh, secretly what the type of structure you look, look at is as just uh, logarithmic singularities. Okay, but going back to the in the previous session or uh, yes, here, where does this uh, GL1 come from? No, um, um. No, no, from the physical point of view, nowhere in the sense that, the, um, for example, you, you see here, I have my space here, my variables here are x1, y, and x2. If you think about, for example, loops, or actually, even if you think about uh, this uh, formula that I wrote uh, before with the, this uh, measure, obviously, when I put the measure, which is given by some choice of the cosmology, this gel one invariance is gone. So here, the claim is not that. Uh, all this give you also the correct measure of which you have to integrate. The claim is that this picture will allow to compute this uh, uh, the integrand. And then when you want to actually do the integration, you have to put some adequate measure, which is going to break the GL1 invariant. So physically, the full, uh, uh, the full um, FRW cosmology type of wave function doesn't have this, this property. But you discover that the integrand, if you attach to it the measure of, of projective space, it does. So we use this to actually understand the integrand, and then you can actually do the... Now, uh, this is something that I was planning, uh, I, I will try to say tomorrow if, if, if I have time, but um, even... Uh, uh, so there is for certain type of cosmology, for example, if I choose uh, to do, uh, to extract the, um, the wave function for the sitter in uh, one uh, plus three dimension with the phi cube interaction. Now, uh, with respect to this axis, this has still some logarithmic singularity. So you can use this polytop uh, uh, picture uh, even to do the integration. Okay. So there is even some cases uh, uh, for which uh, this picture is, use, is useful not only to, to compute the integrand, 
but also to compute the integral. The integral. Okay. Yes. Think about this integration. That's correct. Yes. No, no, but this is uh, no. Uh, the, actually, the gel one symmetry doesn't have anything. This gel one symmetry doesn't have anything to do with the city because you have it even for flat space with function in flat space. So you don't have to do that. Yeah, but uh, um, I think. Uh, No. Yes. No. No. no uh, uh, ter, uh, um, ter okay. Yes. Yes. No. I agree. But uh, I, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, if uh, I look just uh, uh, to this guy, doesn't have to do with the conformal. Doesn't have to be conformal symmetric. Doesn't have to. Doesn't have to have any of these properties. And also, when you do embedded space, really, uh, and at least the way that he understands it, you typically do it in uh, in a position space. So you uplift, uh, and this is everything in energy space. Okay. That's correct. No, but uh, it's just uh, something that uh, you realize that you can have uh, precisely when, uh, when when you have uh, uh, no, I, I'm I'm not embedding anywhere. Actually, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm just uh, using the very same number of degrees of freedom. I'm not going to a higher a higher dimensional space I, I used used to do for doing the, the embedded space. So in a, so, um, you see, the fact that you can use this trick is due to uh, the um, uh, so. When you have something which has just simple pole, um, you can um, you can uh, hope that I mean typically okay. So uh, let me go one step back. Um, here, one thing that uh, uh, in, we noticed is that if first uh, this thing or uh, uh, written in this energy space, um, it's written all the time in terms of uh, uh, homogeneous polynomial. Then. We said that okay. What happen if we organize you organize these uh, uh, variables of this of these polynomials into a vector to give me some some space? So you say that you have this R three, and then if you attach this matrix, this 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 matrix, which is the typical matrix of P two, you realize that this is gel one invariant. So we say okay, let's use this 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 fact, and then we are or, or and. Um, um, and actually, even backwards, once you realize that you have some uh, something like this, then uh, the natural measure to put uh, the natural way to describe this polytop is precisely through through projective space. So, because here uh, these uh, are not telling you about distances, about vertices, just telling you about uh, um, um, lines in this case in terms of homogeneous coordinates. Okay, and that's uh, it's enough to think that, uh, um, and, and then it's enough, and, and then and then as Julio pointed out before, you can say that okay, I can real, I, I realize that uh, if I put rather than equal zero some positive condition, I, uh, they define some uh, in this case some convex object, some some posi some positive object, and then I know that to this positive object, which is described in uh, this homogeneous coordinate. I can nicely describe it in projective space and attaching this 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 form. So then you say, okay, but this is not the form on which you are gonna integrate later. 
fine, but uh, this picture will be enough for me to describe uh, from uh, the physical perspective to have novel ways of computing the integrand uh, and novel ways to actually um, analyze it. For example, analyze its singularity structure, analyze, uh, for example, or you might be interested what's happened when you go to, when you take residues, uh, when you take uh, multiple residues, uh, um, and so uh, to infer a little bit what is the analytic structure of the wave function. That this, uh, the project is measure is not to measure in which you're gonna integrate neither in general in this to get to the FRW wave function or even to get to the loops because it's not even the measure to, to, to get loops. Fine, you can do it in another way. But just to make sure I understand, this form is going to compute the surface of this, the, the volume of the two uh, No, uh, the, mm, let's say I the, the interest, uh, surface, but if I want, I use this form to integrate the two points. Uh, well, the volume of uh, this point is, is of um, um, okay, um, this actually computes the volume of the dual of the point. Of. Uh, I, I didn't want to talk about about this, but yeah. Can you write it immediately? Then? Why? Why? At all, I'm interested in if I'm not familiar with the geometry, then like, it's very confusing. Why? Why ever? I'm interested in this. Topic? Ah no. Okay. No. No. Fine. I mean, here uh, um, that's a, a super legitimate question because uh, I am not, because um, for the moment the only thing I did it's uh, taking a simple example show that uh, um, and that um, to this example, you get uh, a triangle that you can associate the canonical form and this canonical form is the wave function. Then uh, you, uh, and then you say, okay, but we computed the same object before with these rules. Uh, so what do I need this? Uh, you need this because um, when um, you have, uh, for example, uh, if I give you, this object, for example. Okay. You can still apply, for some reason you're interested in this process. For some reason you can apply these rules, okay? And obtain some uh, humongous expression, but then you want to check that your answer makes any sense. For example, you want to extract some information, some, some process, and you want to take residues, or you want to, uh, to do some, some operation on, 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 uh, on it. Good luck, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the, the point is that, this, the, the, which is, I hope uh, I have time to talk today, that there is a nice way in which, without actually doing, because, um, um, uh, the geometrical equivalent of these rules, you can look at the picture and extract the information by just some graphical operation without doing any art computation, then write the final answer uh, or the information that you want to extract explicitly. In particular, one thing that uh, we could prove, okay, let me, uh, I have just uh, 15 minutes, so probably I will list the things that you can prove uh, with the, uh, the methods that probably I will have described tomorrow, but and, and not today. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, um, I, um, I emphasized uh, a lot of time that the wave function contains the flat space amplitude as uh, um, coefficient of the singularity uh, of the total energy singularity. Okay. Now, for example, one thing that uh, we did is. Uh, um, First, we ask the question, okay, we start from an object, this wave function, which is not neither um, uh, has manifest unitarity, nor it, has, uh, it is Lorentz invariant. It has, uh, when I say that it doesn't have manifest unitarity, is that even if your evolution is unitary, you have uh, an object which is, lives just on a space-like surface. So in principle, uh, um, now we know the, cut, the cosmological cutting rules, uh, the cosmological optical theorem that uh, Enrico formulated. But in principle, if, uh, with, if you didn't know Enrico's work, if I give you that two-way function that is unitary is not something manifest, okay? 
And then also you have an object which is not uh, which is not Lorentz invariant. But you know that the scattering amplitude, especially if you have uh, if you're studying the wave function uh, whose limit you expect to be an uh, Lorentz invariant amplitude. Uh, the, the amplitude is Lorentz invariant. So the question that you can ask is, how do you see Lorentz invariance emerging? I, do you see the flat space scatter rule emerging? And this is something that with the, so you can prove with the few lines exercise on doing operation on, on, uh, on these polytops that you have uh, uh, how Lorentz invariant of the amplitude is encoded. How unitarity of uh, the, the, uh, the amplitude is encoded. Now there is something in, uh, in amplitudes which are called Steinman relations, uh, which tell you that uh, the uh, double discontinuity acro uh, across partially overlapping channels in the physical region ought to vanish. What that means to, of these words, uh, this means that if I have uh, a If imagine that uh, I have some uh, loop uh, 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 six particle process. If I take a discontinuity along this channel, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. And then after doing this, I take the double discontinuity along this other channel, two, three, four, five, six, one. They are partially overlapping because this blob contain just all the blobs contain part of the of the of the particles which are on, on the other side. Then these two are incompatible in the physical region. So you expect that uh, there, there is no uh, the the this double discontinuity is zero. And this uh, actually this fact has been used in the amplitude literature to uh, compute uh, or to make ansatz about uh, higher loop uh, um, amplitudes without having to actually do the, the loop integration. Now, uh, so, for, and the, 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 the proof of these relations are uh, from papers in the 60s and 70s because they were formulated before for correlation function and then mapped to, uh, to the S matrix. And let's say that they are not these, at least for me, the easiest thing to read. With this technology, even you could prove for flat space for the uh, for for the amplitude, you can prove the Steinman relation with a few few line argument with a combinatorial argument. Okay, this is okay. I'm saying all things about flat space. Okay, but we want to know something about cosmology. So. Then, uh, uh, so the important thing of the Steinman relations that the Steinman relations in flat space are associated to causality. So you can ask the question, are those things valid also for the wave function? So we ask this question and we actually show that yes, it's the case. So also Psi satisfies time relation. So, so you know that if you have some arbitrary complicated process that you want to compute, maybe you can use also this type of, uh, of uh, conditions to try to make an answer so without having to actually do the, the, the computation. So, so why should you be interested in, in this from a practical point of view? From a practical point of view, because it gives you tools to uh, understand the analytic properties of the wave function without having to do the hardcore computation. And because any question that you can ask uh, um, on the wave function get translated into the question which are combinatorial geometrically. Imagine that you want to ask the question about the symmetries. Okay, what, what symmetries can have this wave function? Maybe there is some uh, hidden symmetries uh, that we don't know, like, uh, you know, uh, it was found the, uh, 
dual conformal symmetry in the Yangian uh, uh, for, uh, for a certain uh, amplitude and certain graphs in the flat space. You can ask some similar question. And uh, looking directly to an object and making a general statement that this is a, a general symmetry of the theory or it's a symmetry of a graph can be not easy. And this gives you another way of looking at the problem. Okay. Now, from a theoretical, this is from a practical point of view. From a more theoretical point of view, this gives you a different first principle way of defining an object. So I could, uh, if uh, imagine that we were an audience of mathematicians rather than uh, uh, physicists, I could just uh, have skipped uh, all the, the physics part and I could have talked about this object because uh, mm, uh, starting from a first principle definition. And uh, mm, which means that it can give uh, a, some ground to have a different way of looking, uh, of defining this, uh, this problem, because then what you do is you define this mathematical object, you study, and then you talk to a physicist, and you will discover that this is computing something that physicists are interested in. So quantum field theory at the end of the day, what's it? It's also some sort of mathematical theory, mathematical theory that uh, helps you to do some, uh, um, to study physical processes. So um, in, in cosmology or um, in general in, in physics, at least, I mean, now I'm talking uh, from a very uh, motivational point of view for me. So there is, there doesn't have, what I'm saying doesn't have for the moment any practical, practical value. But the point is that when uh, we study some problem and we found difficulties uh, understanding, or it seems that uh, uh, our uh, understanding is breaking down, very likely it happens because the language that we have been using at some point is not the most suitable. So the question is then finding some, uh, um, and for me, I have my personal bias that quantum field theory in, uh, in a curve background, thus is not really the most natural language to describe pro uh, the, this type of processes. So the question is, um, how can I find a different language that uh, can uh, be more suitable? And obviously the first thing that I have to do when I made some proposal, is check that uh, I can uh, uh, recover the known results, the results that are known to be, to be correct, and then try to show that, try to see whether I can go beyond in a much cleaner way. So from a more theoretical point of view, the general aim is to see whether these uh, geometrical languages that has been uh, used a lot in, in amplitudes and now uh, um, with this point of startup PRs in this other context could be any more useful to answer some other question that might be, maybe you can answer already with the quantum field theory in curve space, but might be just more difficult and more unnatural. Okay, so, yes. Consider the three-point three-level diagram. Yeah, yeah, you mean the, the, with three vertices, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, then we, in fact, then we have like uh, five uh, problems about everything. That's correct. Yeah, but we, for each term, we have four poles, so. No, you, you actually have uh, six poles there. Uh, Yes, yes. So, uh, do we have a, like a uh, five form of the? Oh yeah, I mean, I can write. Uh, um, so I can write uh, the these uh, differential forms in um, in a very um, in in a very direct way. Also, because, for example, um, so let, 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 let's do it in that example. Let's say that I have uh, you want to compute. This is the example you want to compute, right? So my space is again, as you said, as five uh, homogeneous coordinate. So this leaves in P4. So actually I can't draw P4. So, okay, one thing that you can observe is that uh, this graph, you can think about this graph as uh, a combination of two graphs of this type, okay? Let me call x2 prime, x2 second, and x3. 
Now, if I, I look this separately, obviously to each of them, there is associated a triangle. So these vertices, so if, um, so um, I, in this picture, if, uh, if I take as basis of our three, x, x1 and y and x2, uh, sorry, sorry, if I take uh, for basis of our three, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, I can actually indicate uh, the, the, the vertices uh, uh, which originally wrote as one minus one, 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 one minus one, and minus one, one, one. I can actually write it. I can actually write them. Uh, if I call this vector x one bar, y bar, and x two bar as x one bar minus y bar plus x two bar, x one bar plus y bar minus x two bar, minus x one bar plus y bar plus x two bar. So why I'm saying this? Because then you know that uh, when you see this, uh, you can associate three vertices, which, are, which have this, this form. So in this case, we'll have x1 bar minus y12 bar plus x2 prime bar, x1 bar plus y12 bar minus x2 prime bar, minus x1 bar plus y12 bar plus x2 prime bar. And the same here. Now, in this graph, this x2 is the same as x2 prime. So really you have a set of uh, six vertices, which are given by x1 bar minus y12 bar plus x2 bar. So you just identify these vectors. I'm not giving the, uh, rig uh, the rigorous mathematical definition. I'm, I just want to give you an idea of um, how you can think about this, uh, this, uh, this polytops. So these are the three vertices associated to this uh, part of the graph. And then there are other three associated to that part of the graph, which they share this X2 vector. Now, the polytop is the convex hull of these vertices. So if I want to compute this, okay, uh, you have six vertices. Um, so, Then what you what you know that you know given that you know that to this um, you have some subgraph with associated to the singularities you can uh, write the subgraph associated to singularities as uh, um, uh, in terms of these vertices and you know that there are six so what you know is that the, the, your canonical function has a denominator which is a polynomial of degree uh, degree six. Here we live in P4, so you have y d4 y. So you know that there is a numerator which is a polynomial of order one. Okay. Now, okay, and this requires some technology that I will explain tomorrow. So I will give you just uh, just a sketch. So if you remember from Julius' lecture, one thing that he drew yesterday is that. Um, when you have some polytop, which is not uh, so simple, which is not a simplex uh, in, the, in, the, in the space. So for example, in, in P2 is a square. A square has four boundaries. So it has four denominators. Leaves in P2 again, it is Y, D2, Y. So also in this case, you have a numerator, which is a polynomial order one. The question is, I can identify, in, in our case, I can identify the denominators looking at the graph. How do I identify the numerator? The numerator, if you remember uh, from what Julio said, is, is given by the, uh, um, the locus, 
which is identified by the intersection of these lines outside of, of, of the object. So this is point A, point B. So this line, in this case, will give you this numerator. The, here, it happened the same. You can actually write this on the spot, knowing which uh, are these vertices. To do the actual computation, I need some technology that I didn't explain today. So for this reason, I'm not doing it because otherwise it will be just, just confusing. I'm just giving you an argument how, how you can just write that. So why, you need, uh, why th this is the case? This is the case because otherwise, given that um, poles are given by the intersection, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, are given by boundaries, having this point here will give you also extra poles in the, in the form. So you need a numerator, which kills them. And the numerator is given precisely by this locus. So, uh, so um, there is a general interpretation of both this, which are given by the, let's say, the sides for a P2, but they are called facets of the polytope. And the numerator, which is given by this type of condition, which is called the adjoint in a mathematical language, but it's just the locus or the intersections of uh, the facet of the point outside of it, uh, uh, which gives you this, uh, the, this numerator. Okay, so there is uh, a, now uh, to compute it explicitly, might be if you have a polynomial of a higher order for 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 a, a polynomial of um, order one, that's that's uh, that's very simple. For high order can be difficult, so you can resort to triangulation. So if you have uh, so triangulation means that for example you can compute a square by just dividing into two. You can compute more, more easily the form of this triangle, the form of this triangle, and you sum them, you obtain the, the canonical form of the full square. So there is not a unique procedure, but you can choose whatever you want. An important thing is that in the context of the cosmological point of the wave function, different triangulations give you a different perturbative expansion, meaning you can get the Feynman uh, rules, you can get your first version of theory rules, and you get some other rules to compute them. And um, but in general, if I give you an arbitrary complicated polytope, you have to feed it to a software to know which are the triangulations. However, the graphical rules that I will explain tomorrow gives you also some graphical rules to know how to compute the triangulation, but using these points. For example, you could compute the, the, the canonical form of this square by just computing the canonical form of this triangle and subtracting the canonical form of this other triangle. Why this is uh, easier to do? This is easier to do for the simple reason that it's, uh, um, um, it is using just the facet, the lines, which are also boundaries, so you're not ever, in, when you do the splitting in terms, you're not introducing spurious poles, because remember, the lines associated to this, the, the, to, to this, uh, the, 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 these lines are associated to the actual poles of the wave function. So if you don't introduce any new lines like this one, so this new line does not belong to the polytope, so it's a, another condition. So if you, you compute this as the sum of these two, you will have a splitting of the uh, of, of the wave function to term with the one denominator which will correspond to this line which has, has to cancel over the sum. In this type of feature, you never do this. But tomorrow you will see how we do this because here I don't have a general rule to do it for an arbitrary polytope. Here actually I do. So you look at these graphs and you can deduce how you can write it using this triangulation. This is actually another reason for which it's useful to do this because this type of rules, you can find some of them which has less terms than the one that you will uh, obtain by just using those, uh, those graphical rules that I explained uh, yesterday. Okay, and I can shut up. <laughs> <laughs>
What is the one in the adjoint represents? This one, this one, the degree of the polynomial. Oh, degree of what polynomial? This is a polynomial. This, are, this is a polynomial of the six. And because of um, a scaling argument, the, you know, the, uh, looking at the subgraph, you know that there are six subgraphs. So you know that uh, the denominator will have uh, uh, um, is a product of uh, six uh, polynomial of degree yes. one. So it has degree six. This lives in P4. So respect to Y, it has, uh, so you have uh, five or yeah. homogeneous coordinate. Yeah, so you, you uh, so if you do the scaling from here, you get some lambda to the six. From here, you'll have lambda to the five. You want this to be G1 invariant. Oh, yes. And then you, you this has to scale like, like one. So yeah, it is. also my question. So we assume this uh, omega to be this very, very First, yeah. then we can directly find out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the G1 invariants allow you to know what is the degree of the numerator that you have. Uh, that can be present when you have, uh, let's say there are some contexts in which you can have uh, um, multiple uh, level poles of, of uh, triple poles. In those contexts, typically you don't have gel one invariance, but you can have gel one covariance. But there you have to be a little bit more careful in how you define things because uh, they're not defined uniquely, uh, uniquely this, this works. Well, here, up to the overall sign, they are defined uniquely. So the, the fact of being able to map something to, uh, to something, something, something else that is GL1 invariant is useful because you have some sort of uniqueness up to an overall minus, which the orientation of the choose. Sorry, so what is the purpose of writing this uh, Y before Y at all? No, here I, here I wrote it just uh, to uh, to make this scaling, scaling argument and to more the test. otherwise we only work with this uh, yeah yeah the, 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 uh, for physical purposes this is the thing that you want to compute okay. Okay. but uh, when you work to project this space you have to be careful of the projective dimension so keep in mind that this guy exists it's, it's okay, okay sure. but for practical purposes uh, you don't need it and uh, one of the questions is uh, triangulation is yes. just uh, like this factorization in uh, when when you, when one of the particles become unshed, right? It is just no, uh, I no. There, there I, well, it is like one of the particles goes to the boundary because, for example, with respect to the story that uh, Julio said, where uh, you know, I don't, I didn't understand his talk uh, to be honest. No. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. So, <laughs> so um, okay. So then I, I'm not gonna make reference to, to, to it. So in this case, so the, the, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so in this case, really, uh, is for example, uh, let, let me think. Because uh, you can just do it in different channels. That's correct. And uh, it is like, uh, for instance, when one tube become a shell. No, but you know, that here is not the case because uh, to do, uh, to have the interpretation that you're saying, you need to consider the full process where you can talk about S channel or P channel. We are talking about now that a single graph has three, we can have multiple right. angularity right while for example when you draw this the only one two three or four the only singularity s is one over s okay so in that case you can say okay i'm doing something s and channel but in that case you're still looking at the same graph sure right. so the interpretation so uh, typically there is no great interpretation for this because some of this type of uh, triangulation correspond to uh, the final rules using the back to back propagator. So you get this one over the uh, two y's um, in front of everything. But some other, you get some other spurious pole that uh, it's not clear what it is. But it's spurious, so you don't care. <laughs> right. But uh, in, instead, in this way, given that you don't ever add uh, these this lines where you keep using the same lines, you have all the time have uh, the, the physical poles. So you, are, you really are doing partial fractioning right without uh, introducing spurious poles. Okay. This, this, uh, this, uh, this is really as a, as a geometrical way of doing partial fraction. Okay. Can I have a little question? Yes. Um really deep but there are like
I have slides. Okay. Can I turn it to Blackboard? No, no, no. no. Uh, yeah. Did you upload it? I send it to the, yeah, I don't Are know. Are they on the website? They're on the website. Okay. It's on the link? Okay. Well, I sent it to the link. So I got this link that said send your talk there. Yeah, so they have it. Oh, okay. Do uh, you have them on the? I have them on my computer. Do you have it here? Yeah. Should I use my computer? Yeah. I said I have one. Sorry. Please, when you find one. Okay. 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 Just closing all my windows. Yeah, the only problem would be that you, you have to connect to that. To Zoom. Yeah. 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 Change the slides on the hmm? yeah, you just have to change the slides on the off. Yeah, okay. Thank you. 
the body. Um, is it possible to remove that yeah. side actually? Full screen, no? Okay, uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Andrea uh, next on, on the background for Celestial Alpine. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to this uh, wonderful place and this very nice conference. Um, I didn't know that there would be like such a central huge blackboard, otherwise I would have given a blackboard talk, but uh, okay, too late. Uh, if either of you don't, don't see the, uh, the screen here, I'll give you some time to move over to the other side. Uh, otherwise, I'll just start. I mean, yes, but it's also very far on this side, so the people in the center may, you know, be a bit, uh, you know, looking like left and right, but okay. Um, all right, so uh, let me start with a disclaimer, um, which is that I cannot change slides. Okay, let's do it that way. Okay, so let's start with a disclaimer. So this conference is about cosmology and the cosmological constant in our universe is positive, albeit very tiny, but I will shamelessly ignore that. And in the following set, lambda to zero. There will be a consolidation, which is that we will not be talking about scattering just in uh, exactly flat space, but in flat space, when well, space times that go to flat space asymptotically, but are non-trivial in the center of the space time. So we'll be looking at asymptotically flat backgrounds. And there are also some features uh, of what I will discuss, which may resonate in some way or other with uh, physics in the sitter space. Okay, so if we look out the window, and by this, I mean not by getting distracted by this beautiful scenery, but if we look out into the night sky, into our universe, and we as theorists want to model the different regions of our universe, here are the three typical uh, geometries by which we model different regions. We've heard already a lot about uh, the sitter space. Um, there's also anti the sitter space, which is useful for describing highly rotating black holes. And then for scales in between, let's say black holes and cosmological scales, um, it is allowed to use flat space, which is a good approximation, at least so long as you're far away from sources. And a lot of the work on understanding scattering or ultimately quantum gravity in such space times over the last couple of years has gone into trying to understand if we can think about gravitational processes in the bulk of these space times by looking at uh, just the boundary data and just trying to describe it in terms of some boundary, uh, some theory that lives on the boundary. Now, um, in ADS, we are in a very fortunate situation because the boundary is time-like, and so there's a natural notion of time. Um, this is not so for both the Sitter and Minkowski space. So this is one of the instances where some physics in uh, flat space uh, that I will talk about resonates with the Sitter. So in one case, the boundary is light-like, in the other is space-like, so there's no standard notion of time. And um, also bulk unitarity is not completely obvious from the boundary point of view. And so those, those are challenges that face both people living in flat space and the sitter space uh, in trying to understand um, how we can describe quantum gravity um, via a sort of holographic uh, principle where we just look at the physics at the boundary. Now, what I will talk about is the flat space context. And there has been a lot of work over the last, let's say half century um, including very new uh, recent ideas that have led to a proposal that there could be a holographic principle for space times that are asymptotically flat. And that proposal that culminated from these very old half century old ideas and some more recent insights into the low energy infrared structure of gravity um, reinvigorated by Stromage and collaborators. This proposal is that quantum gravity in an asymptotically flat space time um, has potentially a dual description in terms of a theory on the boundary. And here we would like to think of the theory that lives on the sphere at the null boundary, the celestial sphere. And we will refer to this theory as a celestial conformal field theory because it has some, it has some similarities with conformal field theories. 
And while I've stated this for four bulk space time dimensions, uh, we expect uh, a holographic principle to hold in general dimensions. And what this proposal offers you is a new perspective or a different perspective on probing fundamental uh, properties of the S matrix and potentially gaining insight about uh, the structure of quantum gravity in asymptotical flat space. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to start by discussing some aspects of this uh, celestial conformal field theories or CCFTs for short. So we'll talk a bit about the observables um, and then the universal sector of the theory, which has to do with symmetries. And then the main part will be to try to take what we have learned from scattering uh, on flat space in this new language and put it on non-trivial backgrounds. And here I will discuss um, um, so in, in uh, the situation where we are in antithesis space, we have a lot of uh, insight on quantum gravity. And one key result there was that the boundary on shell action gave you uh, a generating function of correlation functions. So in the first part of this uh, main uh, part of the talk, I will discuss how this extends to flat space. And then uh, I will get my hands dirty on explicit geometries. And let's, let's see what the um, avatar of non-trivial bulk geometries is from this perspective of the boundary um, CCFD. And then if there's time left, I will discuss um, infrared uh, dressings uh, for backgrounds um, that make them um, finite. And please ask questions at any point during the talk, in particular, if something is not clear. Okay. So the observables in asymptotical flat space time are scattering amplitudes, as you well know, and they are given as functions of the momenta, or more uh, correctly, distributions. In the case of flat space, which I will um, restrict to, um, we describe particles, massless particles, by uh, momenta that we can label by an energy and by an angle or a point on the celestial sphere where the particle goes to. Um, scattering amplitudes have very nice features. Um, we can discuss uh, their analyticity and the unitarity and how they constrain the physical scattering. And they have also very interesting hidden structures, um, such as the double copy relation, which uh, I believe we'll hear more about uh, later today. Um, but these scattering amplitudes expressed in this energy basis are not very suitable for discussing holographic properties of um, quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space time. Instead, uh, we can obtain observables that are more suitable by integrating out all the energies and introducing a new parameter, which I will call delta, which is the conformal boost weight on the celestial sphere. So if we do that, what happens is that our scattering amplitudes take the form of what looks like correlation functions in a two-dimensional theory on the celestial sphere. And why are the nice observables in flat space holography? The, the reason is that they transform nicely on the conformal transformations on the sphere. And the conformal transformations on the sphere um, come from the bulk of the transformations. So they make different symmetries manifest than the usual momentum space amplitude. So you trade um, manifest translation symmetry for manifest Lorentz symmetry, which on the celestial sphere is conformal symmetry. So that's why they're very nice. Um, they obscure some properties, but make manifest others. So for example, they're very nice for understanding what kind of symmetries constrain amplitudes. And here in particular, we have actually infinitely many symmetries that um, were sort of um, more manifestly uncovered by going to this new basis. And the first of those is uh, the famous Bondi, uh, Van der Berg, Metzner, and Sachs asymptotic symmetries, um, which are asymptotic symmetries of asymptotic lift space times. And then there is an infinite power. Um, yes. Yes, we have to we have to think about the amplitude is in a bit different way because so I, I will uh, get to this in a second. Um, once you integrate over all the energies, for example, you no longer have um, or the nice like Wilsonian um, paradigm where you have a decoupling of the UV and the IR. So these things sort of go out the window in this new prescription. Um, you can see this as a bug, but I would rather see this as a feature because it allows you to um, think of amplitudes in a very different way and act, and um, try to um, answer different questions. I'll, I'll say more about this in a, in a second when I'm on the slide. 
Um, but there's a, it's a different way to think about things. Now you no longer have, uh, you know, definite energies, you have definite boost weights. And, you know, you have to rethink a few things that you uh, have understood for amplitudes in, in, a, in a different way. And I will discuss one, uh, one of those uh, things that we have to um, rethink of what, how to describe them. Maybe you can ask again, yeah. Um, so just to finish here, um, so any kind of hidden structures that are fundamental should survive a basis change. And so some of these hidden structures, like the double copy that I mentioned, also survive. But now you have to generalize them to, in this case, operator valued expressions. And this, I think, is the second instance where there's some resonance with a desitter or more general curved space, because I think some of these uh, sort of operator valued uh, structures uh, also appear. And I, I guess Arthur will answer this question later that, in the day. Um, so let me say a little bit more about these observables. So we we like that these uh, that amplitudes look like correlation functions in a CFD. Those are things that we can we can deal with. They are obtained by just taking the S matrix and putting them in a boost basis. Uh, in the simplest case, we start with plane waves. Let's say massless scale of plane waves, um, where the momenta are given by the energy times some null vector Q that points. To the celestial sphere and the plus minus for in versus out and then the way to go to the new basis is by taking these plane waves these uh, external states and melon transforming them um, from zero to infinity over the energy and then introducing this parameter delta and this way we obtain a wave function that's now no longer dependent on energy but on this boost weight and you can check that these new wave functions transform as conformal primaries in this two-dimensional theory on the celestial sphere and uh, I've omitted it, but there's a plus minus I epsilon prescription, which keeps track of inverses out states. So we take our plane waves, we map them to conformal primary wave functions. And then we have um, what we call celestial amplitudes, which are these correlation functions. But this celestial conformal field theory living at the boundary of uh, asymptotically flat space is not your garden variety conformal field theory. And this is in reply to uh, or going in the direction of, of the question. Um, so there's no Wilsonian decoupling because we integrate over all energies. And so celestial amplitudes are only well-defined if the UV is sufficiently well-behaved. So you could see this as a bug because most amplitudes that we would write down um, will have uh, infinite Mellon integrals. But you could also see it as a feature in that in string theory, for example, where the UV is sufficiently soft, these amplitudes are completely well-defined. And so you could use this as a condition that a good UV theory should have a well-defined celestial amplitude. And maybe that helps us in sort of um, constraining from a more bottom-up perspective what kind of UV behavior we can allow. There's another feature that's rather non-standard, which is that the celestial amplitudes, they are not exactly vanilla correlation functions on the celestial sphere. They actually have distributional support. So distributional support in the um, coordinates on the celestial sphere. And this comes essentially from the energy momentum conserving delta function from the bulk. Um, the non-flat, non-trivial backgrounds that I'm going to talk about have the nice behavior that these two issues um, go away. So, yes. And if there is no distribution in the coupling, there is an understanding of how the normalization work or... Um, so... We have understood a little bit about loop amplitudes in this business, but not. Uh, this has not been an extended study. So I can tell you, for example, um, certain loop amplitudes, let's say in uh, Young Mills, uh, in Super Young Mills, can be written as an operator acting on a tree level amplitude. Um, there are infrared divergences, and they are encoded in this in this, op this exponential operator that acts on the on the tree amplitudes. Um, but there has not been an extensive study of of uh, these kind of questions. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the two point function in time in, instead of one over z one two to some power, it's delta of z one two, so z one minus c two, where z one and c two are the points of the where you insert the okay. operators. The three point functions will have, there will be a piece that looks holomorphic. Let's say in Young Mills or in, in Gravity, there's a piece that looks like a nice two point function, uh, three point function. And then there's a piece that is a distribution. And it will be, uh, let's say the holomorphic part is, is nice. And then the anti holomorphic coordinates will be like delta Z12, delta Z23. And for four point functions, it, there will be a distributional support um, that sets the 
conformal cross ratios to be real. So that's that. So it's non-standard from the point of view of CFD, but it's what you get um, by writing amplitudes in this different basis. Um, but yeah, when you put them on backgrounds, then since you break um, some isometries, and in particular translation symmetry, that will go away, and that will make the, the amplitudes more, more manageable in some sense. Okay, so now um, let me finish the, this uh, part of the talk by uh, saying something about the universality, which has to do with the low energy sector of the theory. So uh, as you well know, an important notion in QFT is that of the energetically soft limit, which um, gives universal factorization property of the amplitude when the energy of an external mass as particle is taken to zero. Um, now we're integrating over the energy, so we lose the notion of an energetically soft limit. But uh, we can introduce the notion of a so-called conformally soft limit. The dual variable to energy is the boost rate, and so special values of the boost rate do actually correspond to the different terms in the low energy expansion um, of the energetically soft limit. So this starts uh, at the value of the boost weight being one. So there will be a pole at this boost weight that leads to factorization of the corresponding celestial amplitudes. And that is the celestial analog uh, of the leading soft theorem um, factorization property of the amplitude. So while there is no Wilsonian decoupling, we still have a sense in which the low energy physics gets encoded in some very, um, very uh, ex distinct, explicit um, properties of the corresponding celestial correlator. And the knowledge of um, that there should be something interesting going on at these sort of integer values of the boost width, starting with one, um, gives us actually a bit more insight and lets us actually, um, let's say, start to unravel this infinite tower of symmetries that govern the S matrix in asymptotical flat space. So here I've talked about the leading soft theorem, but there's also a subleading and a sub subleading in gravity. And then there's in principle an infinite tower of terms that you can write down in the expansion. And one question is, can you make sense of these other terms? The infinitely many, do they, what do they do? So this is a question about what are all the symmetries, um, which is of course uh, interesting in its own right. But if you want to construct holographic dual pairs, that's one of the first things that you have to match between the bulk and the boundary. So um, here we wanna ask, can we use the knowledge of soft theorems and some CFD tools, since we, we are trying to describe some putative dual CFD to classify the symmetries. So this is what we have done in, um, in work with my postdoc Emilia Trevisani and with Sabrina Postelsky, and then more recently with my student, Jorko Pano. So what we wanted to do was start with the soft theorems, um, um, write them in this boost basis, where we have correlation functions of operators with special conformal dimensions. And then we wanna run CFT machinery. So we wanna ask, so these operators are special. Um, we wanna classify what are all the water identities for these operators, because that is related to symmetries. And the tool that you use there is conformal representation theory. So now you just use the knowledge that in the soft limit, you find some special operators, and then you use a CFT tool, which is very powerful, conformal representation theory, to write down all the possible word identities for these special operators. And then uh, if you use some standard CFD tools, plus in general dimensions, it's a bit more complicated, but you can do it. You can then construct the currents uh, in this boundary theory, write down the charges and determine what the symmetry group is. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of these constructions. If you're interested, ask me later, but let me just give you the result, which is that in two dimensions, so four bulk dimensions, two um, celestial sphere dimensions. There's an infinite dimensional symmetry group. And that resonates with the fact that from some sort of asymptotic symmetry generations in GR, we know that there are these Bondi, Metzner, Van der Sachs uh, symmetries, which enhance translations to infinitely many symmetries. There's also an extension of that called super rotations. And these super rotations are on the two dimensional sphere, they give you an enhancement of global conformal symmetry to local conformal symmetry. And so they are very important for this sort of holographic um, uh, setup. Or the idea that there should be some underlying holographic principle. Okay, so that's, uh, in, that's consistent with um, the GR analysis and what we know from two dimensional CFTs. In higher dimensions, again, putting together the knowledge of soft theorems and conformal representation theory, and being sort of a quantum field theorist with a conservative view of what you mean by symmetry, 
you find that the symmetry group is finite dimensional. So in gravity, that's just translations and rotations. And that's again uh, consistent with a CFT person would have told you. But then it um, raises the question, what is the role of high dimensional BMS transformations which have been um, discussed in the literature? Okay, so now I've uh, finished the part on um, the different aspects of celestial CFT. Um, if you have any questions now, would be the time. Otherwise, I'll move on to non true. Yeah, okay. So um, when you say that you have this infinite tower of uh, double leading shock figures, so we don't, do not know if uh, they are all independent mm -hmm. or. So uh, what, what I want to emphasize here is that. You just write down, okay, there's infinitely many terms, but they're not universal. I mean, that's, once you go beyond the sub subleading in gravity, they're no longer universal um, and things mix up. And so it's not very clear. What I'm saying is that if you map this to the boost basis, you can just go in general CFT, do conformal representation theory and ask, what are all the special operators? And you will find that for all the conformal dimension, which would correspond to all these infinitely many subleading terms, there is an operator that's special. And uh, I can, okay, use more technical jargon to explain more what's going on, or we can talk afterwards. But there's a sense in which you can classify all these operators, which the, the name is, you look at what all the primary descendants are, and, and they are there. Now, the next question is, which relates to what you're asking about what, how things are independent, how they, are they actually constraining the S matrix and so on. That's a question about what, um, also from this uh, celestial CFT perspective, what do the, all these operators, um, what's their um, constraint on the amplitude, if any. Yeah, but just from representation theory, I can just tell you there's something special about these operators and uh, it can be classified. Okay, so now backgrounds. So ultimately, um, a litmus test for any holographic uh, proposal is if you can keep uh, track of uh, non perturbative processes, um, namely from the boundary theory, if you want to discuss non perturbative processes in the bulk. Now, that's a very difficult question. We can ask a simpler question, which is, what is the imprint of bulk geometries in this celestial uh, conformal field theory, and in particular on the correlators? If you have a non-trivial background, they break asymmetries, and so what happens to the structure of these correlators? In particular, I told you manifest Lorentz symmetry is something that we want because it gives us this conformal symmetry of the correlation functions. And we would also like to understand if we can um, describe bulk geometries just from states in the boundary theory. Um, and this will use, make use of some old and new insights that relate classical backgrounds to scattering amplitudes. So this is in particular work of the last couple of years. So um, here we should remember that uh, if we want to describe amplitude on, amplitudes on backgrounds, um, the classical field, call it phi, that's produced by a source J is the generating functional for um, tree graph approximation to the corresponding quantum field theory. So the classical limit of the generating functional for connected correlators is dominated by the classical um, solution to the equation of motion. And if you stare at that, you will find that there's this relation that the classical solution is the functional derivative of the generating functional um, by the source. So that means that if we differentiate n minus one times the classical solution, it will give an n point correlation function. And I've written this here in a momentum space. So the bar here denotes the Fourier transform. Okay. So that's the, that's the tool. Um, now, the first question that I want to ask is, and which somebody who uh, is very familiar with ADS-CFT may, may come up and say is, well, in ADS-CFT, the boundary on shell action gives you the generating functional for correlation functions in the boundary CFT, um, what's up in flat space? So that's one of the first questions that we want to ask. So if we start with the action, you can write it, massage it into something that looks like the equations of motions, which are zero on shell and the boundary term. And the boundary term is what we will focus on. So in asymptotic flat space, this boundary would be the union of the past null infinity and the future null infinity. And we're gonna look at this question for uh, the simplest case, which is a complex massless scalar that's minimally coupled to gravity. So if I write down the wave equation, I can put it in a form where I have something that looks like the flat space wave equation. And then all the, the source and the Christoffels, I all put into this effective J. And then I make the answers that I have some incoming field and some outgoing field. The incoming is just a plane wave. The outgoing I will solve uh, via usual Green's function methods. And then what I will find by um, computing the boundary, computing the on shell action, but pushed to the boundary, I will get the following result. So if I push it to large R, going to 
this uh, highlight uh, region that's highlighted in blue in such a way that I keep either of the boundary coordinates, so the advanced time or the retarded time fixed, um, then, I then I obtain the boundary on shell action. And what happens in this process of taking R large is that I can use a salad point approximation and all the integrals that are involved in this uh, procedure, they localize. And so what we'll find is that the boundary on shell action localizes on the Fourier transform of the effective source, which is evaluated along the incoming, incoming momentum. So that's a very simple result. Okay, and now I want to relate this to um, the two-point functions, um, or in general, n-point functions, but we did this for two-point functions, to make a relation between amplitudes and um, the boundary on shell action. So from this uh, Bulwer round method for computing amplitudes on backgrounds, um, I had n-point functions. So this is just the, the two-point function that relates the classical solution to the two-point amplitude. Now I plug in um, the result that I obtained when I tried to solve the equations of motion that I showed you before, this one, which relates the uh, classical solution to the effective source. And then in the final step, I will put in what I just uh, showed, which is the large radius, large distance limit, um, which tells us that the boundary on shell action reduces to the essentially the effective source. And so in that way, you can show that um, the two-point amplitude is indeed um, generated by the boundary on shell action in asymptotical flat space. Okay, so this is something that we better hope to be true because uh, it's true in ADS-CFD and if um, flat space holography is anything like that, that's something that uh, we expect it to work. Okay, so now I want to talk about actual backgrounds and compute scattering on backgrounds. And here we will focus on what we call particle-like backgrounds. Technically, what that means is that these backgrounds can be generated by three-point amplitudes with off-shell coherent emission of messengers, such as photons and gravitons. And uh, more um, in, in simpler terms, this is backgrounds that are uh, sources of mass and charge that are, for example, the Coulomb field of a static or spinning point charge. Um, or Schwarzschild on curve geometry, as well as some of their limits, including um, ultra boost limits, which give you shockwave geometries. What all of these um, solutions have in common is that they take the form of Kerr shield backgrounds. So, what are those? So, Kerr shield backgrounds are gauge or gravitational backgrounds, which are characterized by some scalar function V that solves the free wave equation. And um, a null vector is called the Kerr-Shield vector K, which is, well, null and geodesic with respect to both the flat background and some non-trivial uh, pool uh, background in the case of uh, gravity, where you write the, the metric as the flat metric plus some, uh, it looks like a perturbation, but it's actually an exact solution to Einstein's equations. So it's not just a linearized uh, result. Okay, so those are Kerr-Shield backgrounds. And now we can sort of capture the scattering on top of all these backgrounds that I just mentioned by just uh, understanding what happens for uh, Kerr-Shield backgrounds in general. So we'll do this again for complex massless scalars that are minimally coupled to gravity in the presence of some source. And what we do is to get the two-point function as, I, as I've described is we solve the wave equation and we do that iteratively um, in the coupling, which in the case of gravity is Newton's constant. So when we do that, there's a piece that's a contact term, and then there's a piece that's the thing that we want to focus on, which encodes the non-trivial part of the scattering process. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take massless scalars, we want to scatter it off some backgrounds, in particular off of black holes, um, which uh, will uh, either be Schwarzschild or Kerr geometries, but we can also do this for the Coulomb fields of uh, uh, charges. Then we have obtained the two-point amplitude by the method that I just described. Then we'll go to the boost basis and see what the imprint of the geometry is in the celestial conformal field theory. And um, what turns out to happen is that celestial amplitudes on backgrounds are much nicer than in flat space. So again, in flat space, we had this funny delta function support on the sphere, but also in general, um, these Mellin integrals where you integrate over all energies are divergent. On non chill backgrounds, um, this is not necessarily true. So first off, 
the amplitudes that you get are supported everywhere in the sphere. And second, if the background has classical spin, such as Kerr, or its ultra boost limit, the gyrotone geometry, then the spin seems to act as a UV regulator, where um, these energy divergent integrals um, get modified. There's this Hunkel function appearing, and this has finite support. So that's, that's very nice because this gives us a correlation functions that look more like those in normal CFDs. Now we can do something else, something that's interesting, which is the ultra boost limit of black holes, which gives us Eichelberg Sexel shockwave metrics. And there is an analog in gauge theory. And what's nice about shock waves is that they turn out to be generated by conformal primaries in this two dimensional celestial CFT. So, um, to be more explicit, if you take scalar shock waves, so they have some support. Um, so, X here is the space time vector, Q is a null vector that points to the celestial sphere. They have some distributional support, that's a shock wave and then dressed with this logarithm of the space-time vector squared. And you can check that this, um, this shock wave geometry or uh, the scalar shock wave is actually transforming as a scalar primary with definite um, boost weight um, delta. You can construct spinning shock waves via uh, a double copy of the scalar ones. And also in those cases, you find that these uh, backgrounds are actually um, conformal primaries. And what's and this is very nice because now the background itself is described as by an operator in the CFD, and so you expect scattering on top of that those backgrounds to also be very nicely behaved. And indeed, this is the case. So for the electromagnetic and the gravitational shock waves, if you compute two point function on the background, you expect to get a three point function. Where now one of the um, well, the third operator is now the one that generates the background. And what you see here is that. The now uh, three point function in, in gauge theory takes precisely the form that you would expect from CFD. So, this is now the vanilla, vanilla um, CFD uh, three point function with no extra delta function in the angles. Um, since I'm running out of time, let me just uh, flash here also the result for gravity. Um, also, in the case of gravitational shock waves scattering on top of that, you get something that looks like a normal CFD correlator. But um, there are some um, asterisks to it, which I think I don't have time to discuss. Um, but the bottom line is that if you um, describe scattering on backgrounds, you get more similarly looking, um, you get correlation functions that are much more similar to those in normal CFDs and therefore more amenable to, um, to further calculations. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So I will skip the dressing for the background story. This is, let me just summarize this in one sentence, which is that we know um, so here we solved the, the wave equation to leading order, but if you go to higher order in the coupling, you will have infrared divergences. Normally for particles, we know a way to get rid of infrared divergences by dressing them with part of foolish procedure. Here we can do a similar thing for these particle-like backgrounds. Um, and there's a nice interpretation in terms of the celestial conformal field theory, which if you're interested, um, ask me later. So to summarize, I've told you about a new perspective on the S matrix via the celestial amplitudes. Um, we like this because we can use CFT tools and I've um, sort of sketched for you that we can make use of this powerful tool to classify symmetries. Um, there are more uh, curious features about these amplitudes which we still have to fully unravel. Um, backgrounds are nice because they uh, get rid of some of these uh, more funny features, but they're also important for actually understanding a full holographic uh, picture of asymptotic flat space. So let me thank you here. And let's take that. And let me sneak in this. Uh, oops. You can do that too, and it has been done in the literature, and then you also get nice looking correlators in the in the CFT. So actually, the way that we the Lorentz symmetry is broken is very mild. We still have in in all the amplitude I didn't show you to them, um, but there is um, you can so normally you pick for the background you pick a reference direction, but here you can just you know, replace, um, you can just call it reference direction something, and then that something will appear, uh, and it, and everything will look, uh, you know, it will take a nice structure in CFD. For the shock waves, 
that's actually what I did. So the, there was this null vector Q, which uh, is this uh, shock wave. Um, let me go to this one. Oops. So there was this null vector that um, described oh, yeah, yeah. the shock wave here, this one. And you see, so I picked some, some coordinate set shock wave on the sphere. And then when you actually compute um, the, the explicit expressions, that's how it shows up. So it's a sort of a very mild way of breaking it. In this case, it's very nice. In the case of um, black hole backgrounds, which are not described, um, general black holes are not, we don't know yet how to describe them just from this 2D boundary perspective, um, then it will look a bit, little bit more messy. But yeah, you can just characterize that breaking. Yeah. Is there like a more observable than gathering up this example one that you have in computing energy and energy particles? Is there any possible flow of the energy and energy So once you integrate over the energy, what does that become? Integrate energy of the energy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what you would do. And then if that's something that uh, either becomes a mess and then it's not used. Or there are like there are more like in, in mm -hmm. I, I Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Has not been studied. Yes. Did you tell that it's bunch of actually look at it's finite? Because it is we need to go Good, 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 good. So um okay. Uh, okay, I have not, I don't have the details here, I, I guess. Um, so there is, I wrote this here, there's actually um, some constant here that depends on where you put the sources, whether you use the retarded, the advanced, or some mixed uh, Green's function. And, but it turns out that um, there is no, like, if you're talking about the large R uh, issue, that isn't, there is none. It seems that, it, so you would expect, maybe you have to do some renormalization some holographic randomization to get rid of divergences. On the nose here, we just find this result. So super simple. And this, this, in, in, this could be zero for one of the four kinds of propagators, um, but it's not zero for the other three. So there's maybe something more that has to be understood, but on, on the nose, we'll end on something that looks perfectly finite, which is maybe surprising, but. Oh, so here what we have done is we have just, uh, we are agnostic about what the whole, what the geometry is. So that's all in this J effective, right? So yeah, that would be in here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks for this great talk. Uh, I have a curiosity about the paradigm that we had at the beginning. So, um, no, there's various uh, works on Malian transforming Felicity altitudes and, and trying to see what could be a future CFP for the mm -hmm. other side. Uh, so, my curiosity is what happens if one takes some specific CFP and tries to go the other way? Do you have to, to what extent have people tried this and what yeah. kind of amplitude? Yeah. Very good. So, uh, as you are correctly saying, uh, a lot of the work here has been bottom up, taking some amplitude, many transforming, see if we can un, uh, you know, uh, decode something about a putative CFD. Um, there has been recent work that looks at certain young Mills amplitudes on uh, translation breaking backgrounds. Uh, so, this is in reply to uh, Shoda's question. Um, and and they, the correlation functions that you obtain in that way look like those of a Liouville theory. So you could conjecture, or it has been conjectured, that the 2D theory that's dual um, to this uh, Young-Mills theory on that particular background is a Liouville theory, a 2D Liouville theory. Um, but this is still a perturbative uh, conjecture, right? So that's maybe the sort of most advanced statement of uh, uh, the four-dimensional, two-dimensional relation. There's also been work in lower dimensions. So there are two-dimensional uh, S matrices. And, there have also been like proposals of what the, the dual zero dimensional theory is. Um, you could go and pick your CFT and then look at the observables and un, you know, do the inverse Malian transform and see if you land on some amplitudes in some theory that you know. You could do that. Um, it, before knowing enough about the CFT, it seems like a bit uh, fishing in the dark. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we sort of 
worked with this bottom up picture, but there is other interesting work that goes top down, which is this, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this twisted holography story, where um, Costello and Paquette and others, they are um, looking for um, exactly mathematically uh, rigorously dual holographic pairs um, of, of certain uh, special theories with a special amount of, of symmetry or supersymmetry. And there you can identify um, exactly dual pairs. Yeah. I also have a question. Uh, you have a question about celestial amplitude. So if we start with the flat phase amplitude, then uh, the many transformation is quite complicated in particular cases. And um, the function yeah. that we get on the other side, even for simple phases, yeah. are complicated. And also we have this problem with QV, so often it's just in distribution of sense. Uh, yeah. when it makes sense. Now, if we really think about uh, exploring celestial amplitudes from this way, generating data and looking at it, are we asking the right question or are we looking at it from the right point of view? So, uh, if we if you want to find some simplicity, it doesn't yes. seem to be there at the moment. There are other questions that you asked about software and exactly. other things, not directly touching mm -hmm. the case. Or yeah. But what would you say about that? So I think different questions have uh, simple answers in different descriptions. The, I think the real power here from going to this boost basis is because it makes symmetries manifest. So I would like to think of like in scat like scattering of three bases that have very uh, distinct features. One is, of course, the energy basis that uh, we all know and like, and there is very powerful and so on. Another one is in position basis where we have memory effects. So this is particular for the infrared physics. Um, but then we have this boost weight basis, which makes very clear this, the symmetry interpretation. And so I think the, the main power comes from there. And um, I don't know if, if it would have been um, um, like understanding that all this infinite tower of symmetry. So it was found that they actually form an algebra like this W one plus infinity algebra. Uh, and, and OK, this algebra was known, but from a completely different perspective of twister theory. I, I don't know if this would have been found in working in the energy basis. And so this is some very like basic result about the structure of, of let's say, Einstein gravity in asymptotic flat space. And so I think this is where the power comes from. Now, once you've understood everything about the symmetries, maybe for some questions, it's not the best basis, but you know, neither is the, the, the position basis we're talking about. So there's, there's lots of uh, different questions that you can ask and some bases are more suited to it. For me, the power here is that we can use CFD tools. And I, yes, the correlation functions, they um, have this, in flat space have these funny features. In, on backgrounds, not so much, so they're much much nicer behaved. And so, as I mentioned, the, this proposal that there could be a Liouville theory that corresponds to some particular bulk theory. I mean, I think this is this statements of this kind could be very powerful. Um, yeah, but I think it's worth exploring different. Uh, I mean, different questions and different bases, and whichever one is the most suitable should be used. So, yeah. Let me sneak in this this last slide here, since this is also a cosmology conference. So uh, there should be some or hopefully some connection between, you know, celestial bootstrap and cosmological bootstrap, and maybe we can learn from each other uh, about different tools. So if you're interested, let's talk. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. 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 I'm uh, yeah. oh. Oh. Oh, I put him right here. Okay. This part of like a point or something like that. Oh, a point there. Yeah. Oh. That's true. Uh, 
Okay, great. So let's continue. Uh, so we have, uh, we are, you know, who has uh, Martin Lagaret uh, from uh, La Plata talking about integrated negative geometry in this game. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk uh, today. So as here the title says, I will talk in about this uh, recent work with Johannes and Shun about uh, integrating negative geometries in the vision theory. So let me begin with, the, with an outline of the talk. Uh, I will begin with a short review of how can we build integrants from negative geometries. In particular, I will focus on how can we build integrants for the logarithm of the uh, scattering amplitude. Then I will uh, turn to our uh, computations and I will show how we can com compute perturbatively these integrations uh, in the division theory. Then we will, uh, I will discuss how can we use these integrated negative geometries to compute the Casper dimension of the theory. And uh, I will discuss uh, the conformal invariance of the leading singularities of the integrated results. Finally, I will give some conclusions and I will talk uh, about uh, possible future directions. So as many of you know, uh, over the last decade, uh, we have gained a very a new understanding of scattering amplitudes in a very vast uh, amount of theories. And in particular, in this context, uh, the amplitude is viewed as the volume of a certain mathematical object. Uh, to be more precise, uh, the amplitude is obtained from the canonical form of, of what is called a positive geometry. So uh, to be a more precise example, let me first uh, begin by a short introduction to what is uh, momentum twister variables, in particular in four dimensions. So if, you can, if we consider the uh, standard spin of helicity variables in four dimensions, we, and we take the dual coordinates, which, which are defined as uh, the difference between two consecutive momenta in the scattering process. We can introduce momentum twisters as this combination between the spinner helicity variables and these mu variables that are defined in terms of uh, incidence relations. So, uh, in particular, momentum twisters are very useful because they naturally give a dual conformal invariance. Uh, we just have to uh, contract momentum twisters with a suitable levi civita tensor. So having introduced momentum twisters, let's consider the region in momentum twister space that is defined by these constraints. Uh, in particular, let's uh, pay attention to this third constraint, which is the positivity relation between the lines in momentum twisters uh, space that are associated to loop momenta, because uh, Lines in momentum twist of space are points in dual coordinate space and vice versa. If we consider this region in momentum twist of space, we get what is called the four particle L loop amplitude hydron of n equals four superior mills. And uh, how can we get the amplitude from this uh, region? Well, this region is a positive geometry and then has a canonical differential form. And uh, we can get the amplitude uh, from this canonical form. To be more precise, the amplitude is proportional to the canonical form of this uh, positive geometry. Let me introduce this Victorian notation that will be useful uh, for what is next. Uh, we will be using a, a node for each one loop albidrohedron, that is for the region defined by these first two constraints. And then we will be using a dash line for each positivity relation between uh, loop variables. That is for each of these constraints in the far line. Uh, so in particular, for example, for the file uh, loop for particle and pedohedron, the geometry is given by five nodes, uh, connect, uh, where we connect all nodes, but uh, all possible uh, positivity conditions. Very recently, well, some months ago, uh, a new formulation of the n equals four uh, superior mills amplitude hydron was uh, given in terms of what is called negative geometries. So here we have to impose a negativity condition, which uh, I will denote with this uh, red thick line between nodes. And crucially, uh, if we introduce this concept of negative geometries, 
the sum of the negative geometry where the corresponding positive geometry gives a decouple, a decoupling of nodes. So if we take into account this decoupling of nodes, now uh, each positive geometry, which is uh, given by relating all nodes, but all possible positivity constraints, constraints is given now by an expansion by all possible ways of connecting the nodes by negativity conditions. And this is just an expansion of all possible combinations of negative geometries between the nodes. So as usual, if we now take the logarithm of this expansion, we will get an expansion over all possible connected graph with negative geometries. And this logarithm is the logarithm of the canonical form that was associated to a positive geometry. And this logarithm is precisely now what will be uh, related to the logarithm of the amplitude. To be, to be more precise in this affirmation, let's introduce now the interim for the logarithm of the amplitude at L loops, as it is here, where uh, from now on, I will uh, use the amplitude normalized <clears throat> by the trivial value. And the precise statement is that the interim for the uh, logarithm of the amplitude at L loops is directly proportional to this uh, omega tilde form. And here the normalization can be fixed by requiring that the, this interim satisfies uh, certain limits. So what happens now if we take this interim for the logarithm of the amplitude and we perform all but one of the loop integrations? Well, surprisingly, this formulation in terms of negative geometries allows one to say that this uh, integration will be IR finite. And in particular, for the four particle case, this integration is given by a function of a unique cross relation in four dimensions. So, as I mentioned before, this uh, result of integrating all but one of the integrations gives an IR finite uh, because all the divergences concentrate on the last loop interval. So let me uh, give a review of uh, these many interesting results that have been found for this uh, F function in n equals four and and mills over the last years. This function has, computed, has been computed up to L equals four, that is for free loops for the F function. It's, uh, it has been found to be IR finite and to have uniform transcendental delta width. And very interestingly, it has been used to compute the Kasparov dimension of the n equals four super mill theory and the QCD theory to a full to the full for loop uh, order. And by full, I mean that it has been used uh, to compute the first non-planar corrections. And this is done by applying a certain functional over this function f. Uh, I will give the details of this uh, later. Also, uh, the link similarities of the integrated results have been shown to be conformal invariant. And uh, it's, there is a very interesting relation between all, all plus young mean amplitudes and these integrated uh, results. Also, uh, if one takes the expansion of these integrated negative geometries in terms of negative geometries, uh, there has been some non perturbative sums of diagrams uh, in n equals four superior mills. And finally, uh, this analysis of uh, these integrated negative geometries has been extended to higher points, that is, to scattering processes with more particles. And in this case, in the general case, where n, uh, with n particles in the scattering process, uh, this f function is now a function of 3n minus 1 minus 11 cross ratios. And this is exactly the same number of uh, variables as QCD amplitudes. So the question that we wanted to ask uh, to answer in our work is, can we generalize these results that I showed you before, but to other theories ultimately aiming for uh, QCD? Well, uh, given the similarities with n equals four super mills, the ABGM theory, that is the three dimensional n equals six charles simons matter theory is a quite a good candidate to start this program. So let me introduce what is the Abigen theory. The Abigen theory, as I mentioned before, is the three-dimensional n equals six charles simons matter theory, where the gauge uh, group is now un cross un, and the R symmetry is SU4. 
Uh, the field content of this, of this uh, field is given by uh, two gauge fields, both in the joint of the, well, I mean, a mu is in the joint of one of the UNs, and a hat is in the joint of the other UN. There are also four complex scalars that are in, in the bifundamental representation of the gauge groups, and four Dirac fermions also in the, in the bifundamental representation. Schematically, the Lagrangian is given by these four terms, by a Charles-Simons term for the gauge fields, the standard kinetic terms for the matter fields, and then the interaction terms, which are quartic in this case, which is schematically given by this quartic term, term between scalars and fermions, and this uh, term of order six uh, for the scalars. Interestingly, this, uh, project, uh, this uh, positive geometries uh, analysis has been extended to the EVGN theory in the last years. And to do this, we have to take the uh, positive geometry associated to the amplitude hedron in n equals four supian mills. And we have to impose these uh, symplectic constraints on the external kinematic data and on the loop variables. And then after imposing these constraints on the amplitude hino of n equals four supian mills, we get the uh, all loop amplitude hedron for ABJM, in particular for, four part for the four particle case. So how does this analysis in terms of negative geometries looks like in ABJM? So in ABJM now, apart from taking a connected graph to describe this, uh, the logarithm of the canonical form, we have to also take bipartite graph. That is graph where after we assign a direction to each, to each edge, uh, each node now is a source or a sink. And this has been used now uh, to compute the, the, this canonical form omega tilde up to five loops. Uh, so let me know that this is a major simplification in the number of graphs in the expansion. So before uh, giving our explicit results for ABGM, let me make a very small parenthesis to introduce uh, the five-dimensional notation to describe uh, the kinematics in 3D. So this 5D notation basically consists of taking the embedding of the three-dimensional Nikoski space into the five-dimensional Lycon. And why this, is this so useful? Well, if we take this embedding, now dual conformal invariant expressions in three dimensions become Lorentz and scale invariant expressions in 5D. So uh, what happens now if we take the interrand uh, at L loops for the logarithm of the amplitude, and we perform all but one of the loop integrations. Well, now dual conform invariance in ABGM constrains the result to have this form of this gear. And here we can note that there is a parity even term quite similar to the one that was in N equals four super M mills, but also we have now a parity odd term given by this contraction with the F, uh, epsilon levy to tensor. And this is quite similar to what was observed for the five particle case in equals four superior mills. Here in ABGM, we are studying the four particle case. So what are the perturbative results for the integration of these negative geometries? From the epidurhedron, we get that the integrand for the, uh, the for, sorry, the one loop integrand for the logarithm of the scattering amplitude is this one that is shown here. There are some subtleties with an idea of continuations that we have to take into account, but we can get to these results. And from this, one can read that the parity of, uh, even term is vanishing in the integrated negative geometries, but the parity odd term is uh, trivially constant. To go to uh, loop orders, we have to use some uh, loop integrals. In particular, we use this triangle integral that can be obtained quite easily with Feynman parameterizations. And we also use this uh, five layer integral uh, with an epsilon numerator, which is much less uh, trivial than the triangle integral, but can be obtained by iterating Feynman parameterizations. And it's expressed in terms of this uh, transcendental weight two function. So how is the, this integrating negative geometries at one loop? Well, we have to take uh, the two loop interim for the logarithm of the scattering amplitude, which from the amplitude is this one that is here. And we have to perform only one of the loop interims. 
that is we have to leave one of the loop integrals uh, frozen. The loop integral that we perform is only a triangle integral. So we get this result, uh, which is here. And from this, we read that uh, the parity even term now is non trivial, but the parity odd term vanishes. At two loops, uh, we use now the free loop integral for the lowest model scattering amplitude and performing the two loop integrals that we have to perform and leaving one of the integrals frozen. We get now that uh, there is a parity odd term non vanishing and the parity even term is vanishing. And the parity odd term is expressed in terms of this uh, transcendental weight two function that I showed you before. So, what can we say now about the cosmological dimension of ABJM in terms of these integrated results? First, let me introduce what is the cosmological dimension. So, if we take a Wilson loop now with the cusp, with the light like cusp, there are divergences in the expectation value of the Wilson loop that cannot be absorbed by redefining the constant, the coupling constants of the theory. Instead, we have to introduce now a renormalization factor in the expectation value to renormalize these uh, divergences. And as usual, when we introduce a renormalization factor, we can define an anomalous dimension, which is in this case the Kasman dimension. In n equals four super mills, these integrating negative geometries uh, have been shown uh, to be useful for obtaining the Kasman dimension. In particular, we have to apply this functional that is here over the Kasman over the integrating negative geometries, and then we get the Kasman dimension. And as I mentioned before, this was used to compute the four loop customer dimension in n equals four super mills and in QCD, including the first non planar corrections. Uh, interestingly, in the planar limit of n equals four super mills, there is an all loop prediction for the customer dimension that comes from integrability techniques. And as usual, when one uh, performs an integrability computation, uh, at all loops, the coupling dependence is encoded in an interpolating function of the coupling, which is not fixed by integrability. But crucially, it was shown that uh, this interpolating function in n equals four seven mills is quite simple. It's basically the square root of the coupling to all loops. But in EVJM, we have this proposal, also coming from integrability, that the Casmanov dimension should be basically the Casmanov dimension of n equals four but replacing this interpolating function of n equals four to pn mills, but uh, for the interpolation function of ABJM. Uh, however, in ABJM, this interpolating function is much less trivial than in, than, uh, in n equals four. And there is an all loop conjecture that it should take this form that is shown here. If we use this conjecture and this proposal for the Casmanov dimension of ABJM, we get that perturbatively it should look like this. And let me mention that uh, recently with my advisor, uh, Diego Correa and, and a collaborator, uh, we managed to compute the Kasmanov dimension of ABJM to one loop using an interability approach, in particular, a thermodynamic beta ansat approach. So can we obtain the Kasmanov dimension of uh, ABJM from the knowledge of F and, uh, and G? So the answer is we have to use the Wilson loops scattering amplitude duality which uh, states that the logarithm of the scattering amplitude is identified by the logarithm of the Wilson loop, in particular of the tetragonal Wilson loop, in which the vertices are located at the corresponding dual coordinates. And this duality is at the level of the integrands. In ABGM, this duality holds for the four particle case, but it has shown to fail for more than six particles, uh, at least at the level of the bosonic Wilson loop. Then if we use uh, known results for the renormalization theory of Wilson loops, in particular, uh, now the logarithm of the tetragonal Wilson loop is expressed at the lead divergent order in terms of the Kasmanov dimension. Uh, we can use now the duality to say that this is the logarithm of the scattering amplitude. And, but the logarithm of the scattering amplitude is expressed in terms of the negative geometries. So we can relate the integration of the negative geometries with this uh, expression for the lean divergent order of the logarithm of the Wilson loop. And from this, we read now that if we define these functionals, uh, the Kasmanov dimension of ABHM is obtained 
by applying these functionals over the f and the g functions that come from integrating energy geometries. Uh, these functionals can be computed using Melin Barnes, and we have recovered using this the leading order, uh, the leading non trivial order for the customer of dimension of ABGM. Let me comment uh, very shortly about the transcendental wave properties of our results. Uh, in summary, we have obtained that uh, the integrating negative geometries look like this. And from this, we see that at L loops, we have transcendental weight L. And this is uh, different to what was observed in N equals four super mills, that uh, in that case, the transcendental weight at L loop is 2L. Uh, this behavior in NVGM is exactly the same behavior that was observed for scattering in amplitudes and for the customer of dimension. Finally, uh, let me discuss uh, the symmetry properties of the Lean singularities that come uh, from integrating negative geometries. And from Lean singularities, I mean the rational functions that multiply the transcendental functions in the, in the result of integrating the negative geometries. For this, it's useful to consider the Lean singularities in the frame in which the unintegrated loop variables goes to infinity. And we can do this because of the conformal symmetry of the results. Also, it's useful to normalize the Lean singularities by the three dimensional part Taylor factor. And by this, I mean the factor that multiplies the delta functions in the three level amplitude. Doing these normalizations and going to X5 to infinity limit, we get that at at least at, up to the loop order that we computed, uh, the lean singularities of the integrated results look like this. And crucially, uh, these expressions are invariant under the conformal generators. So we can say that uh, in the X5 to infinity limit and normalizing the lean singularities by the three dimensional part Taylor factor, we obtain uh, conformal invariant expressions. So let me give the conclusions. Uh, we study in the EBGM theory, the result of integrating uh, the logarithm of the L loop interim for the logarithm of the scattering amplitudes up to uh, L minus one integrations and for the four particle case. We perform the explicit integrations up to L3. We find IR finite and uniform transcendental functions. We, find the, we found the presence of parity of terms in the integrated results. Moreover, we, perf, uh, we built a prescription to compute the customer of dimension of the theory, and we tested this prescription at the lean non-trivial order, and we uh, got a positive result. And uh, we found a conformal invariance for the lean singularities of the, of the integrated results. So future directions could be uh, in first place to understand the relation of the integrated results with uh, Wilson loops with Lagrangian insertions. And what do I mean by this? In, in N equals four super mills, the integrated results were identified with the uh, expectation value of the, of the corresponding tetragonal Wilson loop with the Lagrangian insertion at an arbitrary point and divided by the expectation value of the Wilson loop uh, without the insertion. In NVGM, this, this is a little more less trivial because now the Lagrangian in NVGM is not a gauge invariant. What is gauge invariant is the partition function. Also, would, it would be interesting to generalize this to higher points, that is to scattering processes with more particles and to higher loops. In particular, maybe uh, this could be done using the differential equation method for Feynman integrals. And finally, it would be very interesting to see if we can sum not perturbatively some subsets of diagrams uh, in MGM as it was done uh, for the N equals four super MB case. So thank you. I have a question about this differential equation method. So is there any economic way how to apply it? Well, we are uh, doing that with Johannes and Shun right now. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, so far we have managed to compute the differential equations at one and two loops. And the next step would be to obtain the differential equation at three loops. Uh, 
to use this uh, basis of master intervals of with uniform transcendental weights to obtain the integrated results at uh, free loops. And maybe that would be some insight of how to then sum no perturbatively energy geometries at all loops. There's also this relation between gamma in an equals four and an EJM. So that works uh, in general for any level of coupling. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this relation. Uh, this one is obtained from integrability and it's non perturbative the relation. Uh, the problem with this is that you have to have an expression for the interpolating function, uh, which is quite not trivial, but there is this current proposal that is also non perturbative So the behavior of the ABJ gamma coupling, what is the behavior of that? Is it similar to the equals four there is a leading? Then, um, yes, exactly. A, a strong coupling is uh, given by half inter powers of the coupling. Yeah. Okay. More questions. It's not thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't even add two after one. <laughs> Thank you. 
The only sharp problem was, I mean, there was no sharp problem that wasn't um, already kind of completely under attack, but the sharpest problem was like binary install. That's, I mean, that's it's a good problem, you know, but, but it arguably uh, in hand. Yeah, I think that's not that one thing that's our problem is all the different points. And the guy was not there with the Thank you. 